All right. Thank you, Dr. Henry Aldridge on the historic Barton organ this evening. Thank you, Henry. And thank all of you for coming out for tonight's Science on Screen presentation. I am Sarah Erlewine. I'm the marketing manager here at the Michigan Theater. And Science on Screen is one of my kind of pet projects here that I'm a really big fan of. Uh, and tonight's presentation is really exciting because it has some local ties. Uh, one of the on-screen subjects in this film the twinning reaction is a psychologist here in Ann Arbor, uh, Dr. Lawrence Perlman. Yeah, absolutely, let's give him a... <laughs> and he will be joining us at the end of this film with Professor Kate Specter Baghdadi, whose title is very large and I must read it, uh, Chief of the Research Ethics Service in the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine at the University of Michigan and Dr. Michael Gibson, who is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Michigan. So that is sure to be a really fascinating discussion. Uh, I saw two of them. I saw uh, Professor Kate and Dr. Perlin speak about uh, Three Identical Strangers, which of course covers uh, the same case that this movie does, but from a very different point of view. And uh, it was a fascinating conversation. So I hope you'll all stick around and hear that. Uh, before we get going, though, I just kind of want to let you know, for those of you who have never been to a Science on Screen uh, presentation, what that means. So Science on Screen is a national initiative by the Coolidge Corner Theater in Boston, and they've partnered with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to present fascinating films about scientific subjects with experts in the field. Um, so we are fortunate here at the Michigan Theater to have been selected for this grant to be able to present this, and we could not do it without equally major support from Arbor Research Collaborative for Health. So at this moment, I would like to bring out Scott Leaning from Arbor Research, who would like to say a couple words to you guys. Thank you, Scott. Hi, uh, I'm from Arbor Research. We're a clinical research company here in Ann Arbor. Uh, we're actually right around the corner on Division in Washington. Uh, we're a healthcare and healthcare policy research company. Uh, we've been in Ann Arbor for a little over 20 years, and I believe this is the sixth straight year that we've been a sponsor of Science on Screen. And we're very proud to be supporting the kind of work that the Michigan Theater is doing here in town. Um, so yeah, I hope the, the movie and discussion is very good. Excellent, thank you. So the running time on this movie is just about 60 minutes. It's a pretty quick one, but I think that it's a really worthwhile one. So I hope that you guys enjoy it and you'll stick around for the conversation afterwards. Thanks. So how many uh, have seen the triplets film, Three Identical Strangers? Yeah, most of you, huh? It's a lot different, isn't it? Uh, how'd you feel about that? People like this one? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. So, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a few minutes giving you some of the backstory on the, uh, the, the, how these films came about. And um, some of you have probably heard this. Uh, there are a couple of articles that Nancy Siegel and I wrote in 2005 and six. If you're interested in getting copies of those, there is a... Um, a list outside a clipboard where you can put your emails and I will forward them to you. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the background. So, uh, as I said, I, I was a research assistant 50 years ago in the study. Uh, I was a graduate student at the time and this was the first job I took out, out of my internship and I was half time on the study and I stayed maybe 10 months altogether. Um, I was mainly working with the psychological data, uh, but I did do a couple of home visits. Well, I did four home visits. I, I visited uh, two of the triplets, uh, Bobby and David. Uh, as Eddie, as far as I know, was not, no longer in the study in 1968. Uh, so they would have been about seven and a half at the time, so I think he, the family may have dropped out of the study. I didn't even realize there were triplets <laughs> uh, until the, uh, the well, I'll, I'll tell you more about it. And, um, and, and I visited, uh, as you can see, with Doug and Howard and tested them. <laughs> uh, being a, 
uh, kind of pack rat, I, I kept the original drafts of the psychologicals, which is, was very handy because we were able to prove that they were, in fact, in the study, because I had tested them. Uh, so I left the study. I was not a twin researcher. I had a career as a clinical psychologist, doing you know, basically a practitioner. I always kind of wondered what had happened because it seemed like a significant study. It was, it was unique in that there were other studies of twin, separated twins. However, uh, they were usually retrospective studies that they were uh, united later in life or discovered to have been uh, uh, twins. So this was a prospective study. And the researchers believed that it was, well, actually it was Bernard's belief that it was in the best interest of the families to, not to know that there were twins. So she believed very strongly, uh, I, I never met the woman, but apparently she believed very strongly that uh, identical twins should be raised separately, uh, that they could then develop um, individual identities and if they were, if they knew that they had a twin out there, they would be constantly yearning for and searching for that individual. So that's, that was the reason that they were uh, actually separated. She had a lot of influence at Louise Weiss Services and basically called the shots. Uh, so I, I kind of forgot about the, uh, the study, but when I came here in 2001, um, I heard Tom Bouchard give a grand round set on the Minnesota Twin Study. Uh, some of you might know about it. And um, the Minnesota Twin Study actually answered many of the nature-nurture questions um, through other means. And I, I asked him afterwards uh, if he knew anything about the Neubauer Study, and he said, oh, it, it's infamous. The triplets were reunited in 1980, and it was in the press, and and, and the researchers went underground and nothing was ever published. Um, he said, but my, uh, my assistant, Nancy Siegel, knows a lot about it. She's writing a, a book that's uh, gonna be treating the subject and, it, and uh, I got in touch with Nancy at that point. Uh, it was a couple of, uh, uh, three years went by before we actually met and um, we, we met in New York and actually tried to get into the Viola Bernard archives uh, and discovered they were sealed until 2021. And uh, Nancy said, I understand Neubauer's still alive. I said, really? And so we, uh, we phoned him and I, I said, you know, I was a research assistant on your study uh, years ago and can we talk to you about it? And he very graciously invited us to his office a couple of days later, it was right after Christmas. And, uh, and we went there and met with him and interviewed him and questioned him about the ethics of the study and so forth. And, and he uh, basically stonewalled just like he did Lawrence Wright in, in those tapes. But uh, <laughs> it piqued my interest. Uh, Nancy and I began to dig into this, it became a kind of project for me. Uh, I think in some respect because I felt that, that some wrong had been done. Um, that uh, you know, these, as, as the subject said, uh, that they were separated for no good reason, that, uh, that the, nothing had been published. And uh, I began to dig into it and found a, a person who had been involved, Dorothy Krugman, who had been the first psychologist to um, actually <coughs> test the, the twins. And this is where I began to get some of the background. So apparently Viola Bernard really did believe this um, very strongly, that twi identical twins should be separated, and had um, done so prior to the study. There were some twins in, in the 1950s that had been separated. Um, but not everyone at Louise Weiss agreed with her. And Dorothy Krugman said there had been some pushback from some of the social workers and they had been just allowed to opt out of uh, doing these case studies for those families. Um, and Krugman talked about 
she, she was a very funny woman, and she, and she talked about uh, a lot of the controversy and the disorganization in the beginning and questions about how to test them and what instruments to use and so on. Um, she said it was like a Broadway show, the, the meetings that they had. So um, in any case, uh, you know, I, I did, Nancy and I did publish these articles in 2005 and six. And um, soon after, I began to get inquiries from people about making films, and um, and, and there was a book. Uh, there were a, a set of twins um, who wrote a book called *Identical Strangers*. Is anyone familiar with that? Yeah, some of you know that. So there was, you know, I met with. I had seen them when they were infants, when they were 28 days old. So they had been dropped from the study. Um, and again, this tended to substantiate, some people say that the, there was an intent to separate the twins in order to study them. But we know that there were twins who were separated and never studied. And um, perhaps as many as, as were studied. Um, and I'll, I'll return to that because there's some question about how many there actually are. But uh, in any case, um, in the fullness of time, so Lori Shinseki showed up, and I, I, had had a, I was kind of fed up with people wanting to make films at that point. But uh, I spoke to Lori, and, and she was the person who really uncovered the, the rest of the story. She, she did an amazing amount of work, spent five years on her own dime doing, doing all the research that was necessary for this film, and in the process, you know, with my assistance, she was able to, and, and Barry Coburn, who did pro bono work for the, for the twins, we were able to get their, their uh, records released from the Yale archives. And, uh, and you saw that that happened, um, I guess, maybe five years ago. Um, what, one of the things that's not clear here is uh, the last woman, Sharon Morello, who, who was interviewed, Lori actually discovered through looking at Howard and um, Doug's records the name of the researcher and tracked her down. And then there's a whole other story that that researcher knew, knew the, one of the adoptive mothers, they were college roommates. Has anyone seen The Secret Siblings piece, 2020? No? So there's a, there's a piece uh, that came out in March last year on 2020 uh, on ABC, and um, it has substan substantial part of the film, but also interviews with Lori. And this, so in any case, Lori, uh, was able to, they were able to, to track down this woman who was the adoptive, Sharon's adoptive mother. And Lori was the one who revealed to Sharon that she was a twin. Um, and, then, and then she went and found her twin sister. So it, it's a kind of an amazing story. Um, so just to bring you a, a, a little more up to date. So um, we know that there were 11 individuals for whom there are records in the Yale archives. So that's four sets of twins and the triplets. We knew, uh, obviously, the triplets and Doug and Howard, and, and then Sharon. So we had identified three of them. After the 2020 piece ran in March, a set of twins came forward who had reunited by chance when they were 23 years old. Uh, One's aunt had seen a, a girl in a diner who looked just like her niece, and she went up to her and found out, you know, you know she had the same birthday as her niece, and, and so on. And, the, and they, uh, so they had been reunited, but did not know that they were studied. So um, they have not, I've spoken to, to one of them, and they've not yet gotten their materials, but uh, they, they've been connected with, with some of the other subjects. Uh, we, Nancy and I, had been pressuring the Jewish board, which is 
the guardian for the records, um, so they're the gatekeeper. We, we uh, a couple of years ago, pressed them to, uh, to notify the, at that time, the two remaining sets of twins that they've been studied, and uh, they stonewalled us and said, for privacy reasons, because of New York State adoption laws, et cetera, we can't do that. Um, after the 2020 piece aired and this other set of twins came forward, um, they reversed themselves and I found out just two weeks ago that uh, they have apparently notified all of the twins, which means there's another set that they've notified. Um, all, uh, all of the subjects have been told that they were in study. All have been told that they can have access to their records. However, they have not yet, and so far have refused to give me any information, whether the gender of these people, whether they had met before, or when they were born, zero. So I'm just taking their word for it. Uh, so we, as far as we know, all of the uh, study subjects have been reunited. So there's other stuff I can report, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll allow us to have a discussion first. But that gives you some of the context for this. And it's, it's ongoing. There, there's still uh, a few days ago, I uh, called up the, one of the research assistants who took over a, a couple of years after I did. And, and we talked at some length talked for over an hour about this study. Uh, she's somebody who had refused to, to give me any information uh, back in 2004 when I contacted her. But again, with all of the media attention, now some people are more willing to come forward. Um, Spence Chapin, so Louise Weiss closed down, um, I guess 1990, no, 2000, I think, 2000. The Weiss Weiss Services closed down. All of their files were transferred to Spence Chapin and Spence Hyphen Chapin, which is another prominent adoption agency in New York. Um, I recently spoke to the people at Spence Chapin asking, so we, it, it began, to, began to become clearer to me, and actually only in the last six months or so, that there were a number of twins who were separated and never studied. Um, there were uh, this woman, Marjorie, uh, this woman, Paula, whose sister Marjorie committed suicide. Um, the, the two uh, women who wrote uh, Identical Strangers were never studied. Um, there was, uh, okay, well, there's another one. I'm not remembering right now. But in any case, I guess just for a number, I want to know how many twins were separated altogether. And the legal counsel I spoke to at, Louise, at uh, Spence Chapin refused to give me any information. Uh, again, citing privacy concerns and so forth. I, I really think it's a, a load of crap. Uh, if, if you're interested in this subject, write Spence Chapin. <laughs> Look up Spence Chapin and write their executive director and tell them that they should release the files on all of these twins. Uh, we're in the fullness of time. Well, we're going to pursue this, but um, you know, so far we we haven't really pressed the, the issue. But there was this other piece of it that I was not aware of. I was just focused on the study and trying to make things right for these subjects who. Um, who hadn't, uh, you know, hadn't had their material um, made available to them. But you know, I, I've discovered that there were at least eight, maybe 10 or more individuals who uh, were separated. Oh yeah, there was a, a set in the 50s, I remember now, yeah, who were separated. So we, we know of, of three of them who were separated. And then there was a very strange thing, I don't know if anybody saw in the Atlant uh, online Atlantic Monthly, uh, a couple of months ago, these two women who discovered that they were separated twins. Um, 
the uh, Michelle and Allison, and there's a, a brief film clip. Uh, the, the director from Three Identical Strangers filmed them getting together in New York. It turns out they're fraternal twins, uh, and yet they were separated and st never studied. Um, possibly it wasn't clear that they were not identical when they were infants. So you know, they went ahead and separated them. So we know of, of at least uh, four sets of twins who were separated and never studied, but it's hard to know how many more. Uh, in any case, let, let me turn it over to, to Katie and, uh, and we'll, we'll have a discussion and, and then your questions. So hi, my name is Kate Spector Baghdadi. Uh, Dr. Gibson and I are faculty at the University of Michigan Medical School, and I run our research ethics service there. We're both involved in clinical ethics. And did you want to sort of start off the response for us to give, contextualize sure. this perhaps a bit? Yeah. And remind us of your background and biography. Um, so I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I was a research scientist for a few years before changing fields and going into psychiatry, but what I was doing was not human subjects research. I did, however, have the opportunity to be a human subject in a research study, and so that gave me kind of an interesting perspective on what it was like to be on the other side of this. Um, but I sit on the ethics committee, and we struggle with some of the issues along these lines. But fundamentally, for the last 25 years, what I have done is take care of patients. Um, I don't specialize in twins. I don't specialize in adoption. Um, but all of those things uh, kind of cross the, the, um, the stage um, uh, in my work. I had a number of reactions uh, to the film and to the study. Um, first of all, I was, I have to admit that, that I was a little bit troubled by the implied message that ran through the, through the whole study that um, Number one, that these twins were separated in order to do research on them, uh, which in most cases did not appear to be the case. Um, and the second was that the difficulties that they had in life were a direct result of having been separated from their twins, which they would have avoided otherwise. Um, now, there may have been some element of that, but that's a, it's a legitimate question, but it's a question that needs to be studied and not one that I would take at face value. Um, from, from looking at the film. Um, just to put things in historical context, the, um, the consultants here, uh, Dr. Bernard, for example, uh, was a psychoanalyst, very much of the 1960s um, period, in which when she referred to studies, when she referred to uh, papers and things, she wasn't referring to empirical studies in the sense that, that we do today or that we outside of psychoanalysis do. Uh, rather, the psychoanalytic community was this close-knit group of people who based their understanding of um, everything about the human psyche, behavior, attachment, etc., on what happened in their clinical offices with a handful of patients who were reflecting on childhood experiences. A small number of them, the object relations folks, actually went into places like orphanages and watched as the children uh, developed attachments and, and as those attachments were broken and things along those lines. And then they made additional surmises. But these, uh, these folks get together regularly and they share papers about specific cases. And um, once while critiquing um, a biography that had been written from a psychoanalytic perspective, I made the observation um, that this is not a scientific method, although these folks talk about it being science all the time, um, that the, the essence of validity for these folks is the vigor with which heads nod in the audience as they present their observations about a single case and then generalize that um, more broadly. Um, I believe that at this time, um, in fact, I've, I know a number of, of papers that, that were written at, at, at this time and for the 30 years before this time, that expressed great concerns about the development of a, an, an integrated, independent ego structure um, when there was 
um, a shared identity uh, with an identical twin. Um, interestingly enough, it's a problem that continues to haunt us. If you're the parent of twins, identical twins, you have to make a decision about whether you're going to give them names that sound alike or not, about whether you're going to have them do things together and emphasize that or do things apart, whether you're going to dress them alike or not. In this decade, it's considered right to do that as little as possible and to help them to individuate. Exactly the process that Dr. Bernard was talking about. 20 years ago, uh, that wasn't the case. Um, it was much more common to make the opposite decision. So she was there actually struggling with the same thing that every set of parents has to struggle with when, they're, when, they, when they have these twins, and was making a recommendation that she believed on the basis of her uh, professional training was the right decision. We look back on that now and think, you know, what could they possibly have been thinking? How could they have thought this was the right thing? I would add one other factor in here that, that is really quite important, and that is what happens when children are waiting to be adopted. They form attachments. They form attachments to the people who give them care, and they form attachments to the other children who are with them, and they do that whether they're twins or not. These twins did more of that probably than others because they were kept together, which is an interesting thing to do if you think that they need to be separated. Um, had nothing to do with the study. It was simply the way things were done. If you get moved a lot during that process, and it was mentioned in one of the reports that one of the um, twin pairs had been moved three times to different foster homes, back to the center, there were orphanages, um, back in those days that were much more common as places uh, to stay as well. Um, one of the things that was well known was that the longer you stayed in foster care, the greater the risk of attachment to your foster parents. And it was common to advise the foster parents, and I, I suspect it still is, to intentionally not become too attached to the children. Not because it was going to be hard for the children, but because it was going to be hard for the parents to give those children up when the time for adoption came. But it was going to be hard for the children as well to lose those attachments and have to remake them. And not to learn the lesson that the person who's providing care for you is always going to be there. But rather to learn the lesson that you can't count on this person to be there. That in fact you might be uprooted and there are specific brain pathways and processes that, that require that message of stability to occur. And if those things don't happen in childhood, then there are, there are somewhat predictable consequences. And we heard about some of those. Um, I'm not persuaded that that was because they were separated from their twins. I would like to know how long they were in those unstable environments waiting to be adopted by a family. Now, if you've got a race against time to get folks into a stable family, and you've got twins, the likelihood of a family coming in and wanting to accept twins may be, it was implied in this case, it was explicitly stated in this case, that there was an opportunity to take two of those kids together and have them go, which would be ideal. But it may be more difficult to do. There may be a longer wait. Um, and so you make this choice. Shall we separate these twins for a stable environment sooner? Or shall we take a chance on them remaining in this unstable holding environment longer? Um, I just looked up an interesting study that tracks um, divorce, or, sorry, um, um, suicide rates um, in um, adoptees, uh, which is four times higher than the suicide rate in uh, folks that were not adopted as children. But what was interesting about this study was that it correlated the rate of suicide with how long it was at, uh, before the child was adopted, at what age. The rate begins to increase at one month after birth and increases linearly up to the seven years that this particular study was done. I find that chilling. Um, 
the processes of um, attachment in a stable environment with or without a twin are essential to get rolling. And if you've got a twin and you can do that and it's somebody that you've already attached with and you can get those two kids together, it doesn't have to be a twin, it can be other siblings. Um, all of the evidence we have suggests that that's the way that things should be moved forward. Um, the cases that we saw here had two processes going on simultaneously. One was what happened to the twinship and the other what happened during the process of adoption. Um, it's hard to sort those two things out. And um, I don't know how much of this same process would be reproduced if we simply sat down with people years after their adoption, if perhaps they had run in, if they had tracked down their adoptive uh, parents, um, adoptive mother, or biological mother, and, um, and had a similar meeting and tried to establish a relationship and then tracked it forward of whether some of the same kinds of, of distress and the same kinds of sense of betrayal and sense of loneliness might not come to light and, and, and appear in that setting as well. So those are just some of the things that I was thinking about as I was watching the film. Yeah, and I think that that's really helpful clinical context. Um, so I'm a research eth ethicist by training and a lawyer, so I'd like to offer a little, perhaps, research ethics context. And I did want to say that even there, though there was some implication in the film that we didn't realize that informed consent was appropriate or that there weren't any sort of rules that we followed until 1974 with the human subjects research regulations, that's a bit inaccurate um, because after the Holocaust experiments and the actual torturous Nazi twin trials, which were horrific. Um, there was a trial in Nuremberg in 1947 where the American Medical Association sent over representative Dr. Andrew Ivey, who went and testified um, to say that actually, yes, in America and worldwide, we have a shared premise of research ethics and medical ethics, and we always ask for informed consent. We always allow research participants to exit a study if they so choose. We always balance the potential risks with the potential benefits of a study. And so that was in the late 1940s. And then again in 1966 and again in 1972 when Tuskegee was revealed, again and again we sort of reinforced this requirement for informed consent of participants. The other thing that I wanted to say was sort of, so I don't have a personal background in this, but agreeing that this is probably true that twins were separated anyway by adoption agencies. Once researchers become involved in something, we actually hold them to a higher standard. We hold them to a higher standard because the assumption, for better or worse, is that a researcher has a conflict of interest because a researcher is trying to do work to contribute to generalizable knowledge as opposed to trying to contribute to the best care for that individual person. So it happens in clinical care all the time. I mean, so when you go see one doctor versus another doctor versus a third doctor, you're sort of randomizing yourself to whatever kind of care that doctor happens to provide. And certainly if you get injured and you can demonstrate that that doctor wasn't practicing within the standard of care, you might be able to be compensated under tort law. But we know that there's a lot of variation in practice. Um, and you know, you just sort of choose who you want or you get assigned to somebody in an emergency room. But as soon as we try to study that, as soon as we try to learn where within that sort of defensible standard of care is the best, what oxygen level is the safest for neonates, sort of what um, time is adoption is optimal for infants, you know, should they stay in a foster home for several months or should they stay in a foster home for a year? As soon as we start to randomize and study that, we are held to a higher standard. Um, and that was true then and that is even more true now and regulated now. And so I guess those were sort of the two research contextualization points that I wanted to make. But we also want, yeah. I, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, and I, I posed this, uh, I emailed Kate about this. So, uh, so this was basically Peter Neubauer's private study. I mean, he, he was the head of Child Development Center. He could pretty much do what he wanted. This was pretty much self-funded. Uh, Lori turned up this uh, NIH grant uh, from 1965. I, when I was there in 68, I didn't know anything about a grant. Um, 
they had some private uh, funding, but it was actually through something that was really the Ella Bernard's foundation. Um, so what's to prevent somebody uh, who's not affiliated with the university? Uh, even though it said that Columbia University was a vow dying, Bernard had an appointment at Columbia, but as far as I know, they didn't sanction this in any way, uh, in, in the positive sense of sanction. Um, so uh, there was no IRB. Well, in, look, at, in those days, there was no such thing, I mean, because we didn't have the formal structures that we do now of informed consent that came out in 74. But what's to stop a, a private researcher like Neubauer who's, who's self-funding to do something that violates research norms? Um. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really good question. And so there are four ways that you have to follow the human subjects research regulations. One is if you're doing research with federal funding. They require you prospectively to follow all the rules. The second is if you're doing research into a drug or device that you hope to submit to the Food and Drug Administration for approval to market in the US, you have to have followed the rules in order for them to accept your data in support of a new drug or device. The third reason is because your institution requires it. So the University of Michigan requires all of its researchers to follow the human subjects research regulations no matter where we get our funding. So we're not allowed to do this. And the fourth way is actually kind of interesting because it's sort of, sort of post hoc, is that sometimes journals will require you to do it. So if you want to publish your work, you have to have follow the rules and you have to have your IRB approval or they're not going to publish it. And that actually happened um, with the direct-to-consumer genetic testing company, 23andMe. I don't know if you guys, any of you guys have heard of that company. Um, but they have been selling their data and using their data for a lot of research. Um, and they didn't have to follow any of these rules because they weren't using federal funding. But what happened was in order to make their data lucrative for selling, you have to be able to publish with their data. And journalists said, hey, we're not going to let you publish unless you got an IRB to approve this. And so that's how they started following the rules. Okay. But so nothing's going to prevent the really sort of researchers sort of going off on their own and injecting herpes into people and saying kids, which just happened six months right. ago. So, so Neubauer was not, uh, he was not funded except for that one small grant. Uh, he was not aff affiliated with the university as, as far as I know. There wasn't producing any kind of a drug or, or device. And he never published. <laughs> uh, but and, that, so and, and actually, he was the editor of the psychoanalytic, uh, um, what's it called, psychoanalytic re review of the child. But in, in any case, uh, he might have been able to get it published. Uh, Although that doesn't make it ethical. It no. just doesn't make it illegal. No, no, no I'm, 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 right. I know, obviously, <laughs> You know, people question the ethics. I don't think there's any question that was unethical, particularly by the current standards. Right. Um, and, and to me, that, that's not the issue. I, the issue is really more, is it ethical for these institutions to be hiding this, uh, this data, or, you know, this information from, from these study subjects and, 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 not, uh, and, and not giving them access. But, Thank, but thanks for your comments. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that we were supposed to, at some point, there was a microphone in the audience yeah. that Sarah was in charge of. Yeah, open it up to the audience. Sarah's back there and has the microphone. Okay. Matthew, let's off your hand first. Hi, thank you. Um, so this is a question for Dr. Perlman. Uh, in the Three Identical Strangers, there was a lot about the study being possibly uh, looking at the birth um, mother having mental illness. There was nothing in this um, story, but also in the memoir, Identical Strangers, they talked about uh, the mental health of the birth mother. Yes. So I'm curious about what you thought 50 years ago, if there was any um, study of that component, and what you think now. Yeah. Uh, that, that theory has been floated uh, by Lawrence Wright and, and by uh, Paula and Elise, who wrote uh, Identical Strangers, because uh, apparently their mother has, has a serious mental illness. Uh, their, their biological mother, who they uh, were able to track down. Uh, I, there is absolutely no evidence for that. Um, we did not, first of all, we didn't know anything about the biological mothers. Um, we, we meaning the research team. Uh, Louise, there was a firewall between Louise Weiss, uh, who arranged the adoptions, and the, researcher, the researchers. Um, 
there, there wouldn't have been any good purpose in having uh, included mothers who had mental illness because we already knew that it was that were, it was transmittable in, in terms of uh, hereditary uh, transmission. Uh, that, that was that was news. Um, Sarnoff Mednick at that time, I, when I was an undergrad here in the 60s, there was a professor named Sarnoff Mednick who was doing studies of schizophrenia in Denmark where they had uh, the huge population bases and he could trace the um, offspring of mothers who had serious mental illnesses. So it, wasn't, it didn't make sense to try to study that. Um, so it, as far as I know, there is really no basis for that. It, but that, that has been floated by some of the subjects who discovered that their, their biological mothers had uh, serious mental illnesses. Now, you've got to remember, I mean, these were unwed, probably young unwed mothers in the 60s. Uh, some of them may well have had some kind of psych psychological problems. Um, and later developed into, you know, serious mental illness. Uh, um, when the triplets found their mother, she appeared to be an alcoholic. Uh, so there, you know, they, there may well have been some of the biological mothers who, who had significant problems, but that was not the intent of the study. On the contrary, <laughs> they wanted to control for that stuff. They, 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 did not, they wanted to keep those people out of the, the study. The other thing that uh, uh, is suggested, particularly in, um, in the triplets film, is they were trying to look at uh, socioeconomic status and, and that the triplets were placed with families of different, uh, different means. Uh, again, there was like no evidence for that. The, 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 the um, format of the study was to place the adoptees in families uh, that were pretty stable and that had an older sibling, usually an adopted older sibling. Uh, so Louise Weiss often knew the families because they were return customers. And um, I don't, there may have been some disparities in, in the triplets' families in terms of financial means, but they were all pretty middle class. Maybe one was lower middle and one was upper middle. And there, was, there were some attempts to, to balance them out with similar family structure with a, an older opposite sex sibling and pretty much a similar uh, socioeconomic status. And, and I, I think they really were all Jewish because it was a Jewish adoption agency. So you know, intended to, you know, the uh, adopted parents tended to be Jewish. If you just want to yell, I'm happy to repeat it into the microphone if that's easier. Hello. Um, I had a question. What was Yale and Columbia's affiliation with this study, and what's their ethical responsibility at this point in time? Yale's responsibility? Uh, so Neubauer deposited uh, these in Yale. He, uh, he gifted them to Yale. Uh, they refused to show me the, the deed of gift. Um, and he was able to, uh, in terms of, of his, uh, his gift, he was able to specify that they would be sealed for 75 years until everybody was long gone. Um, Yale just, it's an archive. They're a library, they're an archive. If, if somebody seems to have have been a significant, significant figure in their field and has uh, papers that they want to donate, then they will accept them. It's very interesting that I, I, there was a whole, actually just uh, in the last few months, uh, there was a guy on the uh, New Haven uh, newspaper who looked into this uh, and, um, and Yale is, was very concerned that if they, Opened these files on this particular study that other that other people would not want to donate materials to them because it would be uh, you know because it would be violating the rules of uh, by which the, this was gifted. 
So uh, they, they've actually considered this, and, uh, and, and I guess they have a good legal grounds for that. Um, yeah, but they're just a, a repository. They, they had nothing to do with, with the study. And, and I guess Neubauer I may have had known somebody. I, th I know that he knew, he knew one of the child uh, psychiatrists up at Yale, and so maybe that's why he picked Yale. Uh, Bernard deposited hers at Columbia because she was affiliated with, with Columbia. Yeah, I mean, two things I will say in terms of the legal context. So one, there are gifting rules that you have to follow and laws. And two, institutions like Columbia and Yale are also covered entities under the Health Information, you know, the Privacy Protection Act. And so they, they might have specific obligations to protect the individual identities of these people. However, HIPAA doesn't protect you against yourself. That is something actually that lots of hospitals and doctors confuse when you ask for your own information. Um, or you have access to your own medical record under HIPAA. Actually, HIPAA allows you to access your own information. So as an example I'll give is, so my previous job, so I worked for the Obama administration for five years. I was the associate director of his bioethics commission. And during that time, we actually uncovered the Guatemala STD experiments. I don't know if you guys have heard about those that happened in the 1940s. The American Public Health Service went down to Guatemala and intentionally infected over 1,000 people with STDs. So the University of Pittsburgh was in the same position. And one of the investigators had donated all of his documents to the University of Pittsburgh. And what they did, as one example, was they immediately sent all of the documents to the government and had us investigate it, which we were able to do. We were able to de-identify the documentation and fully release all of those records. So all of those records are currently completely available online and also de-identified. Um, but we would also offer the information to the individuals about themselves if they request it. So that's just one example of how this could be handled. Um, so I have two questions, and they're not totally related, but one is when you were interviewing the twins, obviously they look alike to you, and you must have linked them together somehow. Did it ever occur to you to mention that to the parents? That, you know, the, the I, you said you interviewed two of the triplets and the other set of twins. Um, and also, I'm wondering if you've ever struggled with, you know, some of these issues, having not done something about it or thought about connecting the twins. Um, and then my other question is, Dr. Neubauer, has anybody ever looked into his background and his bio to see um, what drove him to do the research that he did? He sounds like he has a German accent um, and he was doing studies on mostly Jewish twins, Jewish kids. So. I'm interested. Those are just questions that came to mind as I listened to you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, okay, so to answer your first question, uh, was I inclined to tell the parents uh, that, that there was a twin? No, I, I mean, I... Um, well, so, so look, you have to understand, there, there are very strict uh, adoption rules in New York State, and uh, you have to keep all the information private. And, and we knew that, and, and we were very careful about not violating those laws. So uh, that would be true of any adoptee. Um, there, was, there was no particular reason why I would tell the parents. I, I, there's a clip in, in, uh, uh, in Three Identical Strangers where I, you know, I say, yeah, you know, I saw your... <laughs> that I was tempted to, to say, oh, I just saw your brother last week, you know, uh, this uh, child that looks exactly like you, um, and, but I would have been fired on the spot. Well, yeah, I would have been fired because I would be violating the, the state laws of adoption and, and disclosing information to the adoptive parents that they were not entitled to. So yeah, we didn't... Uh, Look, I didn't design the study. I, I came on after uh, all those decisions had been made. 
I, I, I never attended a research meeting. Apparently, they had research meetings on a day that I didn't work. I was only half time. I didn't have much to say about it. I, I, I was there as a research assistant for, for 10 months, uh, half time, and uh, I had a very small piece of it. So I didn't really think a whole lot about the ethics of the study. Uh, there were plenty of ethical questions kicking around in 1968, uh, as many of you might know. Um, Vietnam and civil rights and, and so on. Uh, but it, it just really didn't occur to me at that time. Um, and it wasn't until I began delving into this in, uh, in 2004 that I began to think about uh, the ethical questions and how wrong it was. There was a kind of notion that uh, it, that at some point the families would be debriefed. Uh, that there wasn't anything formal, um, but I had that impression. Uh, what I've been told subsequently is that Bernard and Neubauer thought, well, if they, there's a good chance that they may run into each other and be reunited when they're older, but by then they'll have developed their own uh, individual identities. And, uh, and it will, it'll be, they'll be able to handle it better. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have thought about it. Uh, I've thought about it, uh, um, the ethical questions a lot, uh, of course, since the, the films are out. And um, I, I try to kind of put myself into uh, the mindset of, of when I was 24 and, uh, and, and the, uh, the norms of that time. But um, the other question was, was about Neubauer. So uh, Neubauer was, was Jewish, and I believe he was Viennese born, and that's why he has an accent. And, um, and people have likened the, the study to Mengele's uh, experiments. And actually, the original title of the film was uh, They Played God. And I discouraged Laurie from playing up the the, uh, the comparison to Nazi experiments. I thought that was that was really over the top. Um, I didn't know Neubauer, uh, but I have learned more about him recently, and I have actually just in, in the last couple of months I've spoken to people who knew him. And they invariably describe him as very bright, very ethical, very committed, that he did many wonderful things, that he was one of the moving forces behind the zero to three uh, programs that, that evaluate children for disabilities um, between birth and, and three years of age, which is a tremendous federal program. And, you know, he was, uh, and that he was also, I mean, somebody, I was actually able to track down somebody whose name I remembered from when I was working there and talked to her at some length. And she, and she uh, he had supervised her as a child analyst. And she said he was just, he was wonderful. Um, Invariably, when I talk to people who knew him, they talk about how charming he was, how bright he was. One woman did say that he was a bit full of himself, um, but unethical. Nobody has questioned his his ethics. Uh, nobody has, has described him as an evil person um, in other respects. I think, I, I think, perhaps short-sighted didn't really understand the full implications of what they were doing. Um, um, Bernard, uh, if, if you read her biography, is, is glowing. She was a social psychiatrist who was involved in many social movements, who's probably a, a real leader and ahead of her time. Um, and uh, again, highly respected, um, but in, you know, also people describe her as a pretty imposing figure who, who was able to get her way because she was so influential. Uh, but people, the, the contemporaneous accounts 
are really interesting. I, I just spoke to a woman a few days ago who had um, followed me in the study, and she, she said pretty much all the same things. Um, and, and she confirmed the fact that, that our concerns were protecting the privacy of the um, biological parents and following the adoption, state adoption laws. The other thing that's kind of interesting is, is one of these people who, who I spoke to, they're kind of my contemporaries, you know. I, I guess they're willing to talk <laughs> uh, now where they weren't before. Uh, she said that, you know, it was kind of like the, uh, this was the beginning of really studying children uh, in the 1960s. There, there were a couple of other longitudinal studies going on in New York by Sybil Escalona and by Stella Chess and Alexander Thomas, and we knew about them. They, they were doing stuff that, that was published and, and that had much better methodology. There was, uh, it was the beginning of Head Start. There, you know, there, there, was, there was a tremendous amount of, of activity around studying children and trying to learn more about them. And uh, child psychiatry was really in its infancy at that time. So there also weren't a lot of rules. Uh, this one woman described it as kind of the Wild West, but she felt it was exciting that they were doing groundbreaking stuff. And, uh, and she, wasn't on this, she wasn't involved in the study, but she was the one who knew about her trained clinically, and, and she had done some other research on, on, uh, in the early days of Head Start. So, so these, these folks, uh, these two child psychiatrists, were really significant seminal figures. And it would, it would be a shame if they're only remembered for this study. Um, I think it, this is certainly a black mark on their reputations. But they, uh, anybody I've talked to who really knew them has, has spoken very highly of them. So, uh, I so Dr. Gibson, did you want to have the last word as our audience trickles out? I don't know about the last out? word. <laughs> <laughs> we do have one last question from the audience, too. OK, just real quickly. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things, to, ways to think about this is these guys were clinicians. They were not researchers. And the first thing that struck me about this study was how amateurish it all was. These guys clearly didn't know what they were doing. They had no idea what they were getting into, and they blundered into this uh, unknowingly. And that doesn't excuse them, but it does make them not evil. Um, it doesn't make them less responsible, though. OK, our final question. A quick question. It's sort of tangential here. With all the information that's come to light as a result of all this studies and so forth, is anything being done by the professional services of psychiatry and psychology on the damage that's being done to the children that's being kept on the borders and separated from their families? I, I, I didn't, I didn't mean to that. Is there yeah, so, any, any so, follow-up? Yeah, the question is, is there anything that's being done, uh, in, you know, services that are being offered to these folks to undo the damage? Um, and I don't know if you're referring just to the folks in this study. I don't know the answer to that. You can answer that. Um, to folks in, what's that? The oh, the Mexican border. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that part of it. You got me on that one. <laughs> um, you know, um, what can I say? This was just one in a series of Not Our Finest Hours, and the story goes on. So I, I, I can't tell you that, um, uh, so Dorothy Krugman told me that uh, that some of the um, study subjects, um, the adoptees had significant problems, and that Viola Bernard provided it uh, untold hours of treatment um, pro bono. Uh, and and they, they did the, the best they could to be supportive of the families. Uh, it was a pretty well run um, adoption agency. So, um, whether they have any continuing responsibility, I mean, it'd be hard to say that these people are all, uh, you know, adults and, and long out of the study. Um, are there any, any uh, um, twins in the audience? Uh, 
who want to, oh, there are some twins. Uh, any identical twins, especially psychologists? What do you guys <laughs> think? <laughs> Anybody who wants to, to comment? Uh, Here, hang on a second, I'm coming on the microphone. Wait, I'm just getting the microphone. I, I, I know I, I read it. There are any twins that don't know that they're twins? <laughs> it's, a, it's a revelation right here. Is my twin out there? Uh, my name is John, and I'm Jeff, which raises your whole thing about parents naming and and we, the whole factor that you brought up about dressing alike and things like that, those are variables that maybe do come into play. I think what makes us unique is our dad earned his PhD here at the University of Michigan in child psychology. In fact, we brought his dissertation from the early 1960s entitled Achievement, Motivation Among Siblings. So I would say that we were probably guinea pigs in my dad's own studies, and I wish he was still alive to be able to see what's going on with this entire uh, controversy with the uh, films that we've been watching. Uh, lately, our basic disagreement is uh, I political, because I talked him down from Grand Rapids, so I think you know where he stands. In the meantime, my wife and I have been raised, born, but actually he was born and raised here for the most part too, so I don't know what happened, he's Nick, like, nicknamed me the Eagle Twin, so. Yeah, he's the right side of the egg, I'm the left side of the egg. And so if you really want to study, I mean, just have a few uh, cameras on us during our political discussions. The one thing I'll mention is that we were part of uh, university school right over here on University Street. Uh, kindergarten, first and second grade. Yeah. And my dad was doing his dissertation at the time, so we were involved in a lot of the, I call it laboratory experiments, where we were called Anything. into, no. <laughs> we were called into the room, we'd be playing as second, first graders. Yeah. And I'm sure this is studies that you guys are well aware of, but we uh, would be interrupted from our normal activities, called into a room. I distinctly remember the two-way mirror and once the door opening and seeing four or five people behind it, studying, observing what we were doing, you know, whether it was putting the square pegs in round holes or you name it. And uh, it was uh, quite an experience that still stays with me to this day. And when you see this movie about feelings and twins and things like that, we could tell you 20 stories where we were separated and being in Grand Rapids or he in Ann Arbor when he lived in Los Angeles and I was somewhere else. Uh, typical stories that you hear from people if you know twins, we've got a dozen of them. You know, I'm glad you brought up uh, the Nuremberg trials, though, because I think there is, and since our dad was a psychologist in that era, I do have, you know, some concern about the fact that there were so many people involved in this that had to have some underlying current of, is this right? Should we be doing this? And that, to this day, and, and as, in fairness, I mean, you look back and say, it was a different time, different place, and people were just sort of ad-libbing their way through this early psychology zone. Right. But I do think there had to be something, as you mentioned, as the attorney mentioned, from the Nuremberg trials and throughout those eras, that there was a baseline that should have said, this is right, this is wrong. And you mentioned that you, doctor, that you did an internship. I'm wondering, was that associated with a, uh, a, a university? Because just to get the internship or some, of, academic affiliation there, you would think that there would be some federally funded dollars involved that they would have been involved. As you mentioned, it was a privately funded thing, but yeah. I would think that somebody would say, you know, we're using these people, yeah. so where's the examination? Yeah, this, this had nothing to do with my, my internship. I, I finished, my, my, my clinical training was at the, the VA, and it, it was, well, actually, I, I, I was still working there half time and then I, uh, I three fifths and then I, I was on the study uh, half time. Um, but, um, uh, but you know, there is um, an interesting question because um, there's this whole issue of, of uh, the, the, the New York State uh, adoption laws and the privacy concerns. Uh, apparently, uh, the Jewish board decided a few months ago that they would circumvent them and let these other twins know that, that, that they were adopted and they were in the study, or maybe they already been, had been reunited. I, I don't know how, I, I think that, and I, I post this to, to Kate, but, um, and, I, and another attorney, um, who, 
I, I don't know that Spence Chapin can't uh, override those laws that there isn't a, uh, and let, the, let all the twins who were separated, the ones in the study and not, um, let, uh, inform them that, that they were twins and they were separated. So I, I, I encourage you to, <laughs> to email or write to Spence Chapin and, and tell them that, that you are uh, interested in this subject and you incur and that you are urging them to, um, to to notify all of these twins who have been separated by Louise Wise services um, so the, and, and the, are the Perlmutter twins here or did they Unfortunately, we have to wrap things up. Mary and Jane, okay. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much to Sarah, and thank you to Michigan Theater for having us. Oh, really thank you wonderful. all for being here. Thank you, Professor Inspector Baghdadi, Dr. Okay. Perlman. Um, I would like to, if you are open to it, suggest that perhaps people could meet you in the lobby to for, have further conversation. Oh, sure, and, and you could put your, if you want to put your uh, email address there, I will, I can send you the, um, the copies of the two articles. Yes, yeah, so there should be a clipboard on the marketing table, which is just across the way here. It's got all of the flyers on it. If you are interested in signing up for that, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for joining us, uh, Professor Spector Baghdadi, Dr. Gibson, Dr. Perlman. Thank you all. So uh, have a great night.